<laughs> adventure. I think it worked. Hi, everyone. I think it's working. Uh, welcome to another edition of, well, this is a kind of a co-venture of the Perception Action Podcast and the Talent Equation Podcast. And we got, you can see we got a much fuller house than usual. So the idea here is we were bringing together uh, kind of two groups, uh, the, my journal club and Stuart's conclave. Uh, that So we're going to talk about some uh, the topic of the ecological approach to skill acquisition. So I'm going to pass it over. And for anyone listening, um, if if you are watching along on YouTube Live, the if you post comments either in YouTube or Facebook, uh, I'll I'll see them and I can bring them in and pose them. If you want, if you have any questions or comments along the way, so I'll offer that up. So I'm going to pass it over to Stu to kick us off uh, with this. It was his his idea, so um, <laughs> it was a very good one. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, thanks, Rob, and and thanks for allowing us to gate crash the Journal Club. <laughs> um, I've described this as a field trip because <laughs> uh, so the, the conclave is the uh, is a learning community. So basically, a group of people coming together. We get together once a month um, on a Monday evening, uh, Monday morning for Simon, who is our uh, uh, Australian uh, uh, member, and um, it's it's actually probably Tuesday morning for you, Simon. I think is it not? Yeah, I think so. Is that yeah. His coffee. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday morning, yeah. So uh, we're we're all time zoned up, and um, and we're getting together, and we have, you know, what I describe as a as a fairly emergent conversation, like uh, like the podcast, where we gather together and discuss issues, topics, uh, things that are on our minds, um, areas of focus. Um, you know, it, it it can go in all sorts of different directions. We've gone into lots of different uh, subject areas. Um, I'll let the group come quickly, just come. There's probably some new members that you've not met before, Rob. So I'll let everybody just do a very quick hello and intro in a minute. But um, the reason really we got together was um, we found ourselves having a discussion in between the sessions over WhatsApp, which is what we, we, we generally do, uh, about your your latest series of videos, and in particular, the one that was about the ecological approach and the information processing approach and the incompatibility between the two. And it stimulated some interesting conversation and debate. And uh, and I said, well, you know what? This might make quite a good conversation for our next conclave. How about if I ask Rob if he'd be happy to have a conversation with us all and to do some sense making? And lo and behold, being the kind fellow that you are, Rob, you uh, you agreed. And so uh, we just thought we'd have a bit of a conversation and to and to sort of stimulate some of the discussions to go from there. So I'll do a quick round the room with everybody to let everybody just sort of say hello and introduce themselves. And then we'll go, I'll I'll probably kick off with a couple of thoughts that I've had, and then we'll. See where the conversation takes us if that's okay with you rob cool uh so uh joe uh on my screen this is your second outing in the conclave just say hello and who you are and what you what you do yeah hello everyone hello rob i'm uh yeah joe um i'm a football coach i work at norwich city thanks joe simon uh simon um I'm in uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, working with um, um, ID basketball athletes predominantly. Great stuff. Mark? Mark Day, and I'm a golf coach. I work with England Golf, Hertfordshire Golf, and also work with club golfers at a local level. Dave Caruso? Dave? Can you hear me, Dave? I'll come back to Dave. Christian. Hi, Rob. Um, I'm up in New Hampshire, and uh, I'm a soccer coach for high school kids. Luke. Uh, Luke Regan, um, London, UK, and my sport is tennis, and I coach all ages um, of uh, recreational players. Marianne. Hi, my name is Marianne Davies. Um, I'm uh, primarily a bench sports coach and coach developer. Um, and uh, I'm doing some research with Keith Davids and Skill Act and equestrian sports. The constraints led approach to developing horse and rider. Absolutely fascinating. And Will Murray. Hello, I'm Will. I'm uh, currently locked in a flat in Belgium, where I'm the technical director of uh, a hockey club, Arlon Hockey Club. 
Uh, and to differentiate, because otherwise Dave will get all angry, you're talking field hockey, not ice. Yeah, the one that doesn't need a, a word in front of it, hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, back to you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, Dave Caruso, uh, ice hockey over in um, Columbus, Ohio. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Well, um, so Rob, uh, firstly, um, I've got to say a big thanks to you for taking the time to put that video together. I imagine it, there was a fair amount of work that went into it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and it, do you know why I think it's brilliant, Rob? Because there are so many times now when I enter into a discussion with somebody, usually on social media, as I'm sometimes, sometimes apt to do, and I can just link to your video because it explains so much about what we need, what we need to do. But I guess just as a quick question, what was it was what was the kind of prompter that kind of made you kind of want to put that together? Uh, yeah, thanks, Stu. I, I appreciate the compliment. Yeah, it was kind of the same as you. I was getting a lot of questions about, you know, what is the key that what are the key features of the ecological approach? What are the differences and and I, and a lot of times I would, you know, see people just talking about one thing, like they were focusing on nonlinear versus linear. And I wanted to kind of press them on people. It's more than just one feature that differentiates to them. So um, kind of for my own, and I wanted to kind of put it out there and, um, you know, and, and kind of, I, I love that we're doing this extension. I, I If anyone knows the history of, of James Gibson, you can look this up online. James Gibson was famous for these things called purple perils. Um, he would go to class with all these notes and things about his theories, and he put it to challenge. And they're purple because I think they're called purple perils because he Xeroxed them and had ink. <laughs> um, but you can look it up. You Google purple perils. You can see all of his things. So he was constantly putting his ideas out there and letting people challenge them and talk about them. So I would love to continue that, that, that uh, tradition he started. Well, um, knowing the conclave as I do, that's certainly what what will happen here, Rob. Is you know you'll get all the kind of good, all the kind of good and difficult questions that you know people who are you know these are people who are curious, interested, explorers, a little bit a little bit like uh, yourself and myself, and actively doing this, we're coming together to share our experiences and to you know kind of bring those questions to the table. One thing that um, occurred to me, just as a, I guess as a way of kicking this off a little bit, was in in one of your follow up videos, you mentioned how um, teaching games for understanding sits within an information processing approach. And I have to say that one took me by surprise because I definitely saw it as sitting more in the ecological space. So I, I just wanted to sort of explore that with you a little bit more and 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 firstly understand a bit more about why it sort of sits more in, into, in information processing and and you know where where it sort of aligns in the spectrum of different methods i guess yeah i have to admit i'm not like a huge expert on on that but i think you know from my view if i look at things the ones i think of like the game sense approach that mm. um shane pill i think is the, is the one he's done some wonderful stuff explaining that it seems to me that the the goal of that is for to develop knowledge about game situations, what I'm supposed to do in this situation, what the tactics are in that situation. The keyword understanding, understanding doesn't seem to be, in the true sense of the word, is not really an ecological word to me. Uh, in, in the understanding of what I do in this situation, what I do in that situation, um, it, to me, that's more of a mental model kind of approach um, to me. I know it's a very subtle distinction, like, uh, you know, that you can use games. So games, using small-sided games to encourage people to pick up inf different information sources. Um, it also, if you look at the way it's done in terms of the questioning periods and things, a lot of it seems to be questioning about why you know why you did this what so it's it's the classic distinction i would make between gibson's knowledge of and knowledge about right so in to me if you want to use games for a, um, an ecological approach you the questioning would be posed in a way that people responded by acting versus sitting there telling you what the tactics and things like that and i know uh, you know danny newcomb and i think keith have a paper why why teaching games for understanding is not the constraints led approach and so that's where so, well, I get a lot of those ideas. But I think it's a pretty, I know you and I have talked at the level of coaching, some of these things become a little 
you know, whether it's a big distinction or not, it's not critical, but that's the way I think of it. Okay. And, and that, that's, that's helpful because I guess there's, um, the, the thing for me about a lot of the kind of game based is side of things is that I think they, for me, feel like they're closer, you know, you've talked about the, um, the buffet, if you like, or the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, it, they feel like they're closest to sort of the ecological end of the table more than they would be more in the kind of very traditional stage, mainly because it's the environment that's sort of leading the activity. But you're right in the sense that when the coach's role is then to elicit an explicit understanding from individuals, then that's where some of the things can go wrong. But I think there are ways in which game sense applications can be utilized and teaching games for understanding applications can be utilized that are kind of more ecological than less, if that makes sense. Or at least that's something that I would probably want to explore in, in more detail. Right, I'm gonna open this up because um, I know there's a lot of people and I'm probably coming to you first, Mark, you're not gonna be surprised about this because obviously you've been musing and interested uh, quite in, in a lot of this stuff and sharing some of the things in the chat. So um, let the floor is yours. You can, you, I, I'll give you the, the first question to pose to Rob. Oh my God, I don't know um, <laughs> if I can get one question out. <laughs> There's so many. Um, Rob, those videos are outstanding. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, I guess I guess based on what we've just spoken about there, one of my first questions is related to memories and past experience and how that's utilized in the information processing, yet not necessarily utilized as the message I received in the ecological approach. So I just wondered what um, role memories and previous experience has in the ecological approach. And I've just written down there is, is um, and I don't know how sports specific this becomes as well. But if I've solved a problem in golf and I want to remember how I solved that problem so I can recall it at a future time rather than have to resolve and go through the whole process again, how how, how does that fit in? I, I kind of feel like I'm, I know the answer, but I am struggling to make sense of that, how I teach that, especially in a transactional world where people want answers. Yeah, th that's a great a great question, Mark, and that's a really common one people have about what what, what memory. And I think there's a key distinction in in the way you posed it is the di distinction between remembering and memory. Um, so in the ecological approach, so the traditional way that we learn is through people think we learn is through the accumulation of knowledge. Or you accumulate information that you can use later. In the ecological approach, what we think happens is the I know the expression I've seen. Claire Michaels and David Jacobs use is that learning is just a change. It's just a change in the relationship you have with your environment. So we learn from our experience by changing the, in the golf, for example, the control law we're establishing between the movement of the club and the information, probably proprioceptive information in golf mostly. So we're, we're remembering, we remember that new relationship that new control, that new information we pick up, we remember it. Like the next time we go out, we have it, we've learned from experience, but it's not through memory. It's not through remembering the whole scenario and being able to pull out, okay, I did this, I did that. It's just establishing a new relationship with our environment. So I don't know if that, so it's remembering without memory, <laughs> which is real, right? So we're not, it's just a different way of looking at, at what happens when we learn, I think. Um, so, so we're not, it's not, we're not building up these big scenarios, these big, so if we're not acting by pulling out like these things from memory about how to do something, then we don't need to develop a whole bunch of those to act. Right? So that, I don't know if that, it is a, I hope that helped a little bit. It's a super tough question, Mark, <laughs> that people have struggled answering for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And I guess one of the things, and I, and I get that, and always yeah. I kind of listen to your videos and I think, oh, that makes sense. And then you say the very next thing, and I go, no, it doesn't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're so subtle. The differences are so subtle. But that the difference between remembering and memory is, is cool. And I guess that then leads to me, um, and I feel my challenge is the world of golf is absolutely riddled with information processing. And I don't know how or what advice you might have even to kind of challenge that a little bit because i feel like people come to um a lesson or have an experience with me and there's already a preset expectation yeah no i see that i get that a lot of sports you know um that this you know tell me what to do and thinking about it is you know i think um 
one one of my favorite examples of golf I always use. I don't know who someone told me about an example of, you know, when you you you're you're trying to teach someone to pitch a shot onto the green. To teach them that, you you give them the ball and ask them to throw it to the to you. You say, "What did you do?" I just I just threw it to you, <laughs> and then you ask them, "Well, now pitch it." Well, I got to get my club in this, and like they describe a million bodily part, you know, technical details. So, um, I think that it, that is a you know I think it's just trying the different methods and and moving away from from the over instruct the instruction about you know internal focus and things. Um, I think you know putting these ideas in the head and and. You're right. There, it doesn't mean that people don't do these the information processing approach a lot of times. Right? So you're talking about getting coaches more in, in, or athletes? Well, athletes initially. Um, mm. But I'm because I'm thinking again. We talk about you can't you can't integrate the two, and mm. certainly based on the video, I can understand why that isn't possible based on what you presented, without mm. a doubt. But I, I wonder, first of all, a student is going to get access to both of those ways of developing skill, um, mm -hmm. either through media or, or other coaches uh, that they might engage in, or even players, other, other uh, participants that they compete with. Um, and then they might also be exposed to an ecological approach. So students are being exposed to both, um, would be my gut feeling. And so I guess one of the questions was, is that true uh, or do coach, do students gravitate towards one style of coaching and other students will gravitate towards another style of coaching? And if that is true, is there no reason why a coach, it wouldn't be acceptable? And I can't really think of any specific examples right now where a coach might deliver in an information processing way and an ecological processing way, not together, um, but in, by design of a session. Um, that, that contributes to knowledge about and knowledge of, which enhances the experience? Yeah, so I think but the answer to your first one, definitely. I think people are being taught in very different ways from, you know, if they really seeking out lots of different coaches, I see that all the time. People are given different cues, instructions from, and they kind of, sometimes they conflict with each other. So I think that's really common. Um, you know, I, th I that's a really tough question, whether it's I, – I just, in my mind, I find it hard to see how those two things wouldn't conflict with each other, right? Giving you – telling you how to swing the golf club and, and spending all that time to get your basic form and technique down and then letting you go and figure it out on your own afterwards. Just don't, I don't see how those things – how a coach can manage both those things. Um, you know, I think um, – Maybe in terms of planning and thinking about, you know, maybe describing some of these things might help. I um, mean, like you said, knowledge, knowledge about, but I think actually controlling the action is, is a very different, different thing. So, but so I, to me, I, they just don't, they seem to have totally different objectives of what you're trying to achieve. But I do understand the, I, I do relate to the practical problem of, of when people are getting information from both, both sides. Yeah. And I guess just the last one from me yeah. for now, just to, yeah. otherwise I could like, take over the whole time, <laughs> is um, again, in the world of golf, and forgive me for keep bringing it back to golf, but oh. that's kind of my domain. Um, there's been some incredibly successful golfers. In fact, you look at the practice habits of golfers throughout the ages and throughout the years, and, and even now, there's there seems to be definitely a combination of um, off-course practice, which might be about technical development. Uh, and then there's on-course practice and time spent on-course in play problem solving um, and adapting to different conditions. And again, I just wonder how much of that is just driven by the student's ability to filter information and understand that one environment um, is serving one purpose and another envi environment is serving a separate purpose and, and how they combine in order to help them perform um, to the highest level that they can. And, and or when they are being given um, information processing design and, and content that within themselves they're actually filtering that through and, and understanding and making sense of how that is going to be um, adapted to play so they could be on a driving range what looks like block practicing hitting the same club but within themselves they are constantly adjusting because they, they make sense and can make sense of how that's going to relate to their next challenge or yeah I just I just wonder in the world of golf is just yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. I think we have to be careful sometimes about thinking that the 
ecological approach is just in context playing the game, right? You can do an ecological approach. Like the classic example is famous example is Don Bradman in cricket, right? Don Bradman did an ecological approach in his basement <laughs> by hitting a ball off a water heater, right? He wasn't trying to master some traditional technique in cricket. He was adding variability and messing around, <laughs> which is very so. So the so I think we can do the ecological approach. You, you know, the, the idea is sometimes we get this you know, from representative design that has to be exactly game-like. I think we can we can move it away from the driving range. So I think you're right. We could, you know, playing, trying to play different shots, fades, you know, things on a driving range maybe looks like locked repetition, but I think it could be, you know, we could add variability and, 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 and um, you know, and the thought process, I think we separate kind of the thought processes of what athletes think they're doing the cues they're using from the actual control for me. You know, sometimes, you know, I, a lot, there's a lot of cases I see in baseball where the cues and what people are thinking while they're doing something are completely different than what they're actually doing. But so I, I, I think um, with those two things, uh, really specific context practice and doing more things that look like drills can both be in an ecological approach, if that makes any sense. Just to add to that, it, it, Mark, I think it's it's less about the practice form itself, the type of practice, and more about the way in which the practice is, where the starting point of the practice is. And so a really famous example is Tiger, um, who, you know, when I spoke to his junior coach, Rudy Duran, who was coaching him from the age of about four, I very deliberately at the time, because I was quite interested in this particular area, I actually got a chance to speak to him at a seminar and I said to him how much time did you spend with Tiger on the course versus on the range and he said 85 percent of the time we were on the course and they had a he had an 18 hole par three course that he used to block out the t4 for junior golfers in the morning to go and play um, and he owned the facility so he could do this and he said that Tiger would play with his dad and with Rudy and they would play and then Rudy would wait for what he called the coachable moments when there was a problem. And then what would happen then is they would then go to the range and it would usually be because they discovered something in the game that then they wanted to be able to then explore and work on a little bit more when they were in the when they, when they were on the range. So they were working backwards. And and I have got no proof of this, but I am convinced that, you know, Tiger was famous for not missing cuts for a long, long time. And most of the time I genuinely believed it was because he was just so brilliant at playing the game because he learned the game first and he improved his technique sort of quite famously later. Um, just a just an idea about kind of almost like that that ecologically driven approach, which is that, you know, we're, we're, we're discovering things in an environment and then we're going to then find ways in solving the problems maybe in a, in a more isolated space, but not completely isolated. And then we might then go back into the environment. So just an interesting concept there. Yeah, and I, well, last point, Mark, I would make you know separating the the setting of attention and intention and goals from the actual control of action. Even though then you know I think they're all linked. I think thinking that you you know skilled attentionality, knowing what goals you should have in the right situations in golf, is something you know tactic strategy we can work on. Um, that I think people kind of think of that as information processing, but you can think of that kind of thing in the ecological approach as well. I think. And it, it's kind of separate than than the actual control of the action that I usually focus on myself. Yeah, and then I guess I get just that makes that makes perfect sense. And I like the Tiger story. And in, in, you might have said that before, Stu, but lay it into Rob's video. Actually, I can completely relate to that because he understands the environment, and everything he does is about the environment. So the environment it shapes what he's doing, as opposed to. I guess the world of golf nowadays is you're you're taught to do something outside the environment and then you're told to go and try and apply that in the environment which then becomes the information processing so if i've got that right that that makes sense yeah, yeah so i would contrast you know learning to pick up affordances you know recognize this i can play this shot in this situation versus learning a bunch of rules if I get yeah. in this situation i should do this if i'm in a green long bunker shot i should do that Right. So those are the way that you kind of contrast. They're both achieving kind of the same thing, how to set your right goal, come up with the right strategy, but they are in very different different ways.
And I've seen a video actually, just sorry, just to extend the Tiger story oh. a little bit further. Um, I've seen a video as well uh, of Tiger talking about when he was around his middle teens. Um, he said one of the challenges he had was he would see six or seven different shots all the time. He loved the, the act of the creativity of finding the different shots. But the problem is he couldn't always commit to one. So he actually worked with a psychologist to help him really focus down into what's the shot I'm going to hit and what am I going to stay committed to. And interesting, that, that's an interesting potential alternative of when, you, when you've worked sort of in that ecological space is you potentially could see a myriad of possibilities. Um, yeah. And actually defining the one that you want is sometimes the big challenge. And that was his big challenge when he was in his middle teens, I believe. I'll find the video somewhere. It's really interesting. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Stu. Sometimes we tend to think of affordances are binary. I either pass or shoot, but they're really a layer of affordances with different, you know, va with different values. <laughs> Some of them are, are stronger than others. Some of them are going to, you know, so it, I think that's probably what Tiger was describing. Yeah. Um, Christian was, was, uh, was up next. He's got something that he wants to build on from Mark's inquiry. Uh, yeah, it was one of them. And then, uh, he kept going. <laughs> <laughs> You covered so much, Mark. Um, I don't know. It was, it was awesome. So mine, mine went back maybe back a few steps, um, and just trying to wrap my head around the instructional approach versus the ecological approach. The instructional approach in coaching is uh, corrective, and it feels as though that has a very particular model in mind of where they want that athlete to be. And so it's this constant note, you know, you need to be over here and now you need to be over here. And we're trying to get you to this end point where the ecological approach uh, doesn't necessarily know an end point uh, because it, it sort of treats every individual as just that, you know, they're on their own unique path. And if we're talking about youth sports, some kids may go on and be elite athletes and some kids may not. And we're, you know, and we're training more than just, you know, the technical abilities of players. We're talking about character development and whatnot um so my uh, i'm just getting off of a of a two-month season that we were fortunately able to get in uh, despite the the pandemic um and really trying to move continue to move toward e the ecological approach what, what i'm having a very difficult time with is um measure measuring how effective it is because you know i think that's one of the addictive things about instructional approaches that there's a lot of measurables and even if those measurables really aren't that accurate or you know um it it's addictive because you can at least look and see these are our benchmarks and we were able to achieve these things as, you know as a team and then with the ecological approach there's a lot more faith in the process um you know, it was, it was a great experience for the kids. You know, we got a lot of great feedback from them at the end of the year, which I think was um, really important. But as far as, you know, their skill development, skill acquisition, you know, I can sort of see from my perspective if, if people are, are growing and adapting to their environments. But I, I need that feedback just so I can constantly tweak, learn how to tweak the environments that I'm giving to them to be more effective. So anyway, I guess that's my question is, is where, where can we look to those? How do we measure? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. I think the first thing I would say is a little bit of pedantic, <laughs> the instruct, so instructional ecological approach, you can use instructions to, right? You can use cute, you can still use instructions to the player. They're just used in a different way. So I would just be, you can, we're going to get into this in a future journal club, actually, right? You can use a construct instruction as a constraint. Um, so that would be the thing. But um, yeah, I th that's a fantastic question. I think what I'm going to say is something and I'm going to punt it to the coaches in the room, <laughs> like Stu and Dave that have been using it. But I think it really depends on what, what stage you're at. Um, it is really different because you're right, we're moving from convergence, right? How close are they getting to what I want? To really what we want to see is divergence. How are they coming up with a bunch of different ways to do this? Are they exploring? And I think a large part of it depends on what kind of stage they're at. Like if you're really early on, you, you having them do anything, even if it's not particularly effective, I think it would be a good outcome for a practice. 
But then as you, you know, get closer, I think you do want to try to see related to the goal. Um, and, and, and so may, can I, can I get some examples from coaches in the room? Uh, I'll hand off. Ha Steve. Hands up anybody who wants to chip yeah. in. Simon just put something into the chat. Simon, your, your yeah. thought on this? Well, I mean, apart from just um, uh, how do you measure stuff, I think with ecological as opposed to structure, you think about what it is you're actually measuring as well. I think Rob sort of alluded to it. Like you're not you're not trying to um, you're not trying to measure um, the same sort of things. Um, so so to start with, it, 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 it's clarifying in your context. What are the things that are important from an ecological perspective that, that that you believe is going to help the athletes to improve their performance? If that makes sense. Do you have examples? Yeah. No. No. Well, yeah. You know, if if you've got any, if you've got any. I, I mean, I was just going to chip into that as well. So one of the one of the challenges that you'd have, Christian, with measuring, um, is the sense that you. When you set out these sorts of measurements, it very much depends on what you what what it is that you'd measure. Now, ordinarily, we would look for things like you know, kind of outcomes or outputs or whatever it might be that determines you know whether you're having the kind of impact that you're looking for. Because I know what you what you're saying is, how do I know if it's working? How do I know if what I'm doing is having the effect that I'm looking for? Um, so we'll all chip in a minute with 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 something with some thoughts. So my view is. Um, when I'm when I'm looking for indicators that we may be getting somewhere, it's 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 usually in areas where, for example, uh, I, I'm in. I genuinely think that what I'm often trying to do is almost like educate attention or educate awareness is probably a better way of putting it. So one of the things I'm looking for is are are groups of players picking up cues in the environment so that they can self-organize in order to be able to solve the problem that the game's presented to them. And what I do is present them with a load of, a load of problems in training, and then we explore different ways in which they could explore it. So I would then be then looking to see in a game, for example, in, in the training, I'd be seeing how, how initially their, their cueing and their awareness is usually not necessarily that well they're not well, they're not that attuned, right? It takes them a little while to get start to become attuned to the various pieces of information that are going to be useful to them. And then after a period of time, they start to pick it up more and they start to get get in there. So it's it's their speed at which they attune and their speed at which they respond and they can start to discover. And then what you start to find is they start to solve the problems in ways that you would never have conceived. So, so that's where your measurement starts to go out the window because now they're onto something else and they've taken you somewhere else and you can't quite get, you're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Okay, now, they do, now they're doing it in that way. So that's one of the things that I tend to use or look at is their ability to utilize information, attune to information, and then problem solve collaboratively. And that's one of the reasons that they then become really quite adept at doing so in the game environment without my input necessarily, or at least, and that, or at least that's the other then measure is when they go into a competitive environment, are they able to do that without coach input? And then, so that's the self-organization piece that emerges because they're self-organizing under constraints. So the constraints present them with the problems. They self-organize as a result of that through attuning to what the problem is presenting to them. And then we see how they emerge. So I guess the measurements that you can start to look at is A, are you seeing them attune? And it might be because you see them in action or you see them verbally coordinating amongst themselves and pointing to areas of attunement, areas of awareness between themselves. You see the coordination taking place. You see the court. You can hear the court, the, commu the communication taking place, which is one of the reasons that silence is very important when you coach ecologically, because you're not transmitting information into the space because you need to be able to attune to them and how they're acting and reacting and interacting. And that becomes really, and that's, that's what I'm looking for all the time. So I'm constantly looking for, what clues are in their actions that, that elude me or can suggest to me that actually what's what I'm asking for, sorry, not what I'm asking for, the problems I'm presenting them with, uh, they are able to pick up some of these environments. Now, that's not to say I'm always presenting them a problem with a particular answer. I'm just presenting a problem and then seeing how they respond to it. And then we can then work from that. So that's a very long-winded answer to that measurement problem. Will, sorry, you had a couple of ideas too. 
Yeah, from one long uh, one long winded answer to another. Um, yeah, my 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 thinking is is it comes down to your your individual philosophy and your personal view of what you're actually trying to achieve anyway, and that might change as well session by session. Um, for me, one of the the um, really powerful benefits of an ecological approach is it fosters a lot of interconnection between the participants. So I think you can have some psychosocial measures in there that you wouldn't necessarily have in an information processing approach where it would probably be more technical, tactical, physiological as your, as your KPIs. Um, I think as well, the other, the other thing I would say is, is looking at the adaptation of the player. So you know roughly, or, or generally you will know, depending on what um, demographic you're working with of players, of how they are going to interact with a problem. A lot of the time you'll you'll have an a, an idea of where it's going to go and assessing the adaptation the speed and rate of adaptation i think is a really good kpi which is kind of what you were saying stuart to be honest and then the other one that i would look that can be really powerful um is just is the measuring of your own interaction or need to interact with the environment uh, do you need to intervene how regularly do you need to intervene in terms of the behavioral um adaptations or, or you know just general behaviors that the athletes are, are exhibiting um we, we've all been in sessions i'm sure where you've had to do a lot of intervention to to get the energy going and, and i think that's a really good kpi that you've not got it right so working a way that you can measure your own uh, impactfulness i suppose or is, is quite a good one to look at that's my waffle there you go <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a great um, question. We have a, really good, a couple yeah. um from Tom and you know pull in here. Um so why and how do we assist, for example in PE and it says I think I think you, you commented in the, the comments some that you were I was gonna refer you to James Rudd's work and colleagues work um instead of measuring fundamental movement skills, can you skip? Let's measure how many different ways can you get from here to there? So divergent kind of measurements, kind of the thing, things. Um, yeah, that the why do you assess, I think, is what we're all kind of getting at. What what was your purpose of this session? Is it early on you just want them to try anything? Um, is it you're trying to get them to stabilize something that you see? Um, and so I, I think those are those are great questions. Is anyone, did anyone, Marianne, did you have uh, thoughts on this? I'll pick on you. <laughs> sometimes it's it's good to talk to a horse person because they can't tell you what they're doing so Marion has to come up yeah yeah we, we yeah. can't ask the horse or tell it yeah. <laughs> or the dog yeah <laughs> um yeah i so a bit i think um like we said in the chat and and Stu and you both said um finding ways to set um puzzles that that give the feedback themselves so what we'd call like a high validity learning environment so the, the the performer or the learner is getting feedback it's really simple example on a in a boat going to that one is whether you know like if you're not in balance you fall out or you'll fall off the rock so you're getting you're getting immediate feedback from your performance environment by the way it's been set up and it's not requiring a coach to give an opinion about whether they think something was done correctly or not. And that's that's one way. Um, and I do try and use measures of, you know, like perceived autonomy and competence and relatedness again. So going to those sort of like self-determination things, how, um, how much uh, is, is the athlete or the, the, the I mean, I can't ask a horse that, but I can try and encourage agency. So, um, yeah, looking at motivation, I think, is quite important. And and it's a different way of measuring, isn't it? I mean, what is what is likely to happen in the future, I think, is much more important than what's happened in the past. And that's quite a different way of looking at performance. I don't have the answers there, but I, I think that um, it requires a quite different way of assessing performance outcome than than our traditional ip one that would be you know is it repeatable is it technical 
you know, do they remember it when they come back after a break? Can they transfer it into this yeah. similar environment? I think I think yeah. we need to rethink. I actually think it's easier though. I think once you, I mean, I feel it is. <laughs> when I start looking at things that differently, I go, yeah, this I can, I can see they've used different ways of solving this, and you know, it's the decisions are quicker, or you know, the perceived confidence is. Has has yeah, changed. I, I think also so. looking for synergies, right? So is one part of the system compensating for the other in a different way than the traditional idea of teamwork. Teamwork is imposing you. If this person does that, you do this. Mm -hmm. What we want to see is this evolve naturally. And if you have the really fancy equipment, you can do it like Duarte does, where they measure <laughs> positions, how they change and things. But I think looking at it in terms of a team and individual, how are parts of the system compensating for each other kind of naturally without you telling them, you know, if that person attacks, you drop back, right? That you want them to pick that up, the affordances up themselves. Yeah, Duarte's got some really interesting ones that he's done with groups, hasn't he? Looking at the picking up synergies yeah. that the teams aren't even aware of. They're a bit easier with the, the ones yeah. they've used in horse riding because they're just really simple. You know, are they in phase, anti-phase, or just not together at all? Um, but they're yeah, there's some stuff like uh, that's really interesting. So and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and in entrainments. In you know, seeing that with horses and each other, horses and riders, you know, different, yeah. yeah. Well, he has some very cool stuff. Some of his team stuff, the, the team breathes, <laughs> expands and contracts like a, it's really cool stuff. But um, st anyone else, Stu, do you want to pass back to you? To, do we have someone else in the chat or anything, other questions? I. I have a little bit of a question. If, um, well, we'll uh, yeah, we'll oh, we'll we'll had a a question. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll had a question that he was going to come in with. Um. Yeah. So his his one is one actually I spoke to Stuart about it the other day. So, at what point as an athlete centered practitioner um, should we be prepared to compromise our methodology for the sake of the co coach athlete relationship? So you are you are talking about when an athlete has a certain way they want to do something, or, or that yeah, kind of and I think I think also considering um, you know the informational processing approach is more mainstream, I would say certainly traditionally. So mm -hmm. a lot of athletes coming into our care would have a background in that way of learning, and therefore mm -hmm. that's what they expect. So we may long term, you know, want to get to an ecological approach, but do we compromise it in the short term in order to build a relationship? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I and I guess my answer would be to emphasize what we're talking about here is relative effectiveness, right? Where human beings are learning machines, right? We learn if we do nothing. That that's the placebo effect, right? So. I'm not trying to argue that information processing, you won't learn. You won't learn if, if someone gives you prescription. You, you will. You know, there's lots of examples. I just, myself, I, I believe that the ecological approach is a, is a better way. It's a more, leads to more robust, adaptive uh, athlete. But, you know, it doesn't mean those other ways don't work. And I, I, you know, I don't think it would be worth, you know, if you had really resistance to it, to forcing someone to do things a certain way. Um, would be worth it. Um, I think, I also think it, you can add some of the ideas, even though you're really not, you know, you, and the, the, the things I keep stressing too is you, a lot of the things you can use in the information processing, like variability of practice and things like that, you can still use those. You're just using them in a different way. So yeah, I think that's a great question. So yeah, I've had uh, other people ask me, what if the person's really has a learning style of <laughs> the information processing? I, I don't know if there's such a thing, but if they're really resistant to it, then you know I, I don't think it's worth forcing someone to do it. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has experience or thoughts on that. I remember Will asking me this question yeah. and um, and, I, and I, it was a similar thing as well. It would be, you know, it would almost be semi kind of unethical to, you know, to pursue 
something that somebody was finding so difficult or distasteful. But I would be reluctant. And, and we talked a little bit about um, periodization of methodology, or what I refer to as periodization of methodology, which is actually where you do sometimes have to get a group of athletes who are used to a particular way of receiving information from a coach and a particular style of a coach and a particular what they perceive a coach should do. And you do have to get them used to an alternative. And I've definitely fallen foul of that, um, where I've utilized my approach and it didn't work or it didn't suit the group, or at least they didn't feel like it was working. And then that then erodes confidence, it erodes trust, it erodes, erodes the relationship. So you, you have to be sensitive, I think, to the athlete in your application. Um, and if I had my time again, it was a useful learning experience for me because if I had my time again, I would have done a very different approach to the application. I wouldn't necessarily lose the uh, the, the position and I wouldn't u- lose the the way of approaching it, but the the way it would be introduced would be very different. It would feel different to the athletes. They would feel more secure. I created, and I think Rick Shuttleworth talks about this quite a bit. He talks about this idea of safe uncertainty. I just created uncertainty. I didn't create the safe bit. Uh, I'd need, so we needed to move towards the uncertainty bit a little bit more sensitively. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like a middle ground is having them more involved in the planning, like think sitting down with you and laying out all the constraints seeing what they do. Cause I, I think we, sh- we know we can separate what athletes are thinking, what they think about what they're doing and from what they actually do. <laughs> like Franz Bosch likes to say, your body has a little care about what you think. <laughs> right? It's going to do stuff. And so if they want, if it makes them more secure to think that they know the process and all these underlying, then I think you could still do, you know, an ecological approach and get them more involved in it um, without, you know, kind of compromising and, if you have, if you are on that in, in in that view, yeah. But that's a great question. It's a really uh, these are good practical questions about how you do this this kind of stuff. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. So, to me, would that not be down to the skill? And I don't want to offend anyone, um, but the skill of the coach in a con- in a ecological approach. Because to me. It would be I might I would default potentially to an informational process because that's what I've grown up on. That's what I've been taught. That's what I've been socialized into. And a big part of that is because I just didn't know an ecological solution um, at that time. So I just defaulted back to what I know because that would help me continue to build that relationship. But a highly skilled ecological coach could surely go in regardless of the approach of that student and design a session that engages and um, contributes towards their enjoyment and performance of, of whatever they're there for. Yeah, I think so to a certain to a certain degree. I think it depends on the level. Um, I, I I've had, my joke is a, a lot of the ecological approach in, in manipulations involve doing weird things, <laughs> unusual things, right? Using weird sized balls, weird things. And I found personally, especially with higher level ad- athletes, they only have a certain amount of tolerance for doing weird things <laughs> and they'll know the kind of, yeah. but I think you're right, Mark. Definitely. If you can, if you have really bad plans and they're not, not going to work and it's struggling, then it's going to, it's going to be a hard, you keep having to stop it because all oh, that constraint didn't work. It's pr- it's going to be a harder sell. Definitely. I think, I think, I think also in there, Mark, uh, there are, uh, you have to take into account the journey of the coach. As you say, you know, a lot of us are probably more comfortable doing informational processing stuff. If we then suddenly try and do something that we're really uncomfortable with, um, that can also impact that coach-athlete relationship. And I think it can also make us appear quite coach-centered, which can can burn the bridge a little bit. So I think it's, I think it's probably what Rob was saying, really, taking those, um, taking the players on the journey with you getting them involved in in the planning and saying look this is how i think we could do this what maybe you might do it how might you do it you know that sort of stuff Mm -hmm. i i think there is a you make a good point though mark because i i do think it is about your it is about a skillful a skillful approach so my learning from my experience was was just really clumsy (laughs) in the way I did it and I didn't really take them into consideration whereas actually a more skillful approach would have been to have been would have been to have been more um attuned to where they were as a group and not 
being a little bit, you know, I was being a little bit too, you know, pure and trying to ram home this this kind of you know new new way of me working. And actually, had I been a bit more set, and that was just my that was actually my me as a novice because I was still relatively new to this. And so I do think that the more skillful you become, the more able you are to navigate some of these difficulties and you know and marianne put something in the chat it's a good point you know is like what why why would an individual just want to be told or just want to be given this sort of stuff and there's a whole is usually a whole range of other factors at play that probably ought to be ought to be dealt with as well but at the time you just don't know that so you have to try and work through it so i, I totally take that point i do think it is about just becoming more and more comfortable and not just immediately defaulting to what you knew just because you're under a bit of pressure and you need to respond to something um so that's uh, something i would definitely say any other any other questions i'm just wondering luke you, you, we we spoke recently on the podcast about this whole experience around uh you know people coming saying just give me this just give me that i'm wondering if it's sort of sparking any reflections in your mind yes very much so because i think along the lines of golf tennis is 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 very similar in that it's a culture of uh of kind of of of, of being very technical and um the majority of people that come to, to 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 my tennis sessions do want answers and they want answers of of how to do techniques and 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 make their shots prettier and and, and those sorts of things and it becomes a real becomes a very delicate balancing act of, of coaching the way that that, that I want to coach and 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 not uh, not just sort of putting people off completely, but I, I think it, it, I find it quite important to me that if <clears throat> if they want technical answers, that that it that it, it comes from them. So I try and manage it in a way that I I, I kind of uh, give 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 answers to questions that that they want, but but I I'm quite happy to do that as long as they appear to be leading the session so if i feel that they're motivated because they've come with something they want to learn and they want to improve i'm quite happy to to give them instructions and technical information to to help them do that but i, I always try and make sure that they they're always the one leading and i'm just the kind of you know they i'm the i become the assistant coach and, and 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 try and get them to tell me you know exactly how they you know what they want me to do and how i can kind of uh, support them in their in their improvement yeah no i think that's a good point it, and uh i'm just gonna pull in a couple so i think we're talking there's a kind of a theme here about working with the athlete to kind of design help them give information about the practice um so is it the in uh, so i wouldn't say you know in the true sense of what teaching games for understand i i think it it depends on is working with students to design practice the right place for teaching games for understanding to integrate with the ecological approach? In my view, you, you can't integrate those things um, because I think we're talking about a different kind of understanding, right? And Luke, you're get so the students want to understand the solution, right? What is the solution? How do I move my arm? And what we're in the ecological approach, we're, we can't give you that <laughs> the understanding. We're trying to get you to understand how you're going to get, you're going to find it, how we're shaping the problem, right? By, by getting you involved in design constraints, maybe that kind of understanding. But so it's, it's so it's to me, it's a totally different kind of understanding than the, the in the teaching games for understanding sense, right? So if the students really want to be involved and and think about that, to me, that's what I would do. And I, mean, I know that's not really what they're they're asking for, but I think that's that's what I would do. Yeah, and I, and I've I've definitely discovered when i've spent time with ecolog ecological practitioners or you know those who i consider to be highly skilled ecological practitioners that one of the things they're really adept at is <clears throat> providing a rationale for the approach they're going to take um <clears throat> because they know it's probably atypical and so particularly say in golf having worked you know quite a bit of time with people like Kendall Mark, you know, who's very much in this space, um, <clears throat> you know, spends quite a bit of time explaining, explaining about the way, you know, explaining a little bit about skill, and he almost gives like a, a mini ecological lecture without 
ever referencing things like ecological psychology or the ecological dynamics. He just gives you a mini lecture around skill acquisition and the approach that people, the way people learn and a more naturalistic way of learning and, and learning through task and solving a task and these sorts of things. And it's quite interesting then that once you're sort of bought in and you've, you've essentially provided your assent that actually that's something that you want to do and you want to discover with him, then you're all in and you're committed and, and that's when he starts to ask you the really awkward questions that you don't know how to answer. But it's like, I've noticed that that's something that I see people doing quite a bit there. They're not just expecting the individual to passively go along with whatever little scheme they've driven, they've, they've sort of dreamt up. So these people are always kind of providing this kind of provocation to begin with that, uh, that, that engages the athletes and gets their assent as to, shall we work this way? And I've done that before as well, when people have said, look, can we just do this or can you just do that? And I just my my first response is we could. How about if we do this instead? And this is why we might be doing this thing. And so there's this kind of selling the why concept that I find myself involved in all the time. Um, yeah. And that's something I think is important. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Um, another Dave, one. Like want... You're ready. OK, oh, sorry, sorry. Jump in there. Yeah, I was. I was just gonna. I was just gonna ask the question around um, if you used um, Bloom's taxonomy, which I think a lot of um, people with a PE background would, and combine that with a uh, with any sort of methodology, <clears throat> it would it would tend to lend itself more ecological. I know it has a slightly linear approach, but if you accept that different people are in different areas on it, and try to to work your practice up towards um, developing creative performers then surely that fits quite nicely within an ecological approach i think there's also some in like you were talking about luke with tennis there's also some way you know with cues like some of the stuff nick winkleman talks like moving cues analogies so if it really someone really wants you to tell them how to do a forehand you can instruct it in a way that's really focused on the outcome focused on the not bodily focused internal now i admit that might not satisfy some people but i think that's at least kind of a, a better way to do it um dave did you want to come in oh he's good i'm good for right now can i ask <laughs> go, on, yeah. go on mark yeah Sorry, it's, it's probably, um, I was going to ask something because I really um, had a little struggle and battle with myself related to prediction and current future mm -hmm. and those two, um, the subtlety between those two statements. Um, but if I can, what I'd like to do is maybe make a statement just to check okay. my own uh, learning and get your comments on this. Uh, and that would be that if you took Dustin Johnson's performance last night and winning the green jacket at the Masters, an IP approach would explain that by saying that he was um, predicting where he wanted the ball to go and then he was following a set of actions that would lead to that prediction coming true. Whereas an ecological approach would suggest that he was just attuned to his environment and knew that the actions that he would take in that moment um, produced the outcome which uh, led him towards his goal, that he was constantly checking that was leading towards his goal. Would that be, so you so two, two people could watch the same event yeah, explain it in two very different ways. Yeah, I think um, in general, I'm more I would want to more focus it down to the actual control of the swing. <laughs> like, so when he's making a shot, um, is he um, he's predicted how far the ball is needs to go, and he's planned this ball ballistic movement of the swing. So, he, so once he starts it, he just lets it go without any any adjustment. Versus perspective control is is monitoring the in, in Dave there is actually Kathy Craig and Dave Lee have a paper about monitoring the towel gap between the club and the ball. So adjusting online is the current position of my club sufficient to connect to the ball in the right way. So so to me it's it's talking more specifically about the control of the swing rather than planning the shot and stuff. People may be able to extend it that way, but that's kind of what I was more focused on, the actual control of the movement itself. So does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then there's, because I guess there's, that led to me, because sometimes maybe I think of it on too yeah. big a scale, um, but where where is a place for, is there a place for prediction um, in sport? 
So, you know, and how does that fit in? Because it came across in, in the video as though prediction was very much an IP thing, not an ecological thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it's um, I'm trying to calculate and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, in general, people have thought that it's necessary in sports when there's not enough time to react. Like there's not enough time to adjust you know, when things happen really fast. But um, yeah, th that they, so the idea in ecological approach is I don't need, so a prediction is a guess, right? It's a guess about what's going to happen. Sometimes it's a very educated guess, but the idea of ecological approach is I don't need that because I can just, information right now tells me what I need to know, right? So I don't need to predict. I don't need to pre-program a swing ahead of time because information I can pick up during the swing is actually telling me how how I'm moving relative to the ball. That makes sense. So yeah, so in general, prediction the the traditional word of prediction <laughs> there's a lot of arguments over that word but it's 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 information processing idea <laughs> rob if, if i could just follow up on that if if we're talking about a team sport so let's say um ice hockey just so dave doesn't <laughs> feel left out um, if if you're on um well, that's such a fast sport, but even even in ice hockey, I'm sure that the players are scanning their environment before they are part of a play. Well, I guess they're still part of a play if they don't have the puck. They're scanning their environment because they are trying to move to a place to create an opportunity mm -hmm. or an affordance for a teammate. Um, or if you're on defense, you're scanning because you're you're just trying to pre prepare yourself because the game is so fast. That you're trying to prepare in advance of what the possibilities might be. Um, how how might that come into play? With, so, in the, the traditional information concept? processing approach, with what happens there is you're you're developing a model, a three D model in your head of where all the positions and movements of the team. And you're predicting where they're going to be. So, I decide what to do next because I predict from your movement and the other team's movement you're going to pass to me. So you're taking in all this information of this model in my head and I'm making predictions. Whereas the ecological approach is I just pick up a for I pick up the gap information and I, I pick up this affordance. There's an opportunity to break for the goal. So I'm not predict at no time do I predict where all the players are or know where they are. Um, I'm just picking up information relevant to what I'm trying to achieve directly in the moment right instead of creating so a model is a representation of what's in the outside world that's so it's a representation of the positions of all the players on the ice and things um that's a kind of the traditional internal model approach um so i'm doing all these computations of how people are moving calculating predicting that where the puck's going to be um instead of just picking up information directly online if that makes sense <laughs> And so there's an interesting question on the come in on the comments, uh, Rob. Uh, Dave Colclough has asked yeah, us about I mean, things I like just saw it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dave, uh, he runs coach education at the PGA in the UK. Uh, good, good friend of mine, good colleague. Um, and this idea about not using yardage books and knowledge of areas of the green. Now, as far as I would see, I, I don't think that's necessarily just representative of information processing approach. That's information. That is the information presented in the environment, and and it's and what you're doing is you're going to utilize that information then in order to um, define how how we might act in the moment. Um, the difference is is if we were to try and to try and do do this by saying right, it's exactly it's exactly this, so I'm going to do this. Um, the the issue is is that the difference with a mental model in a golfing context, for example, is is the equivalent. Um, mark of like going out there having kind of pre-mapped out every single hole and the way you're going to play it and then not being able to react when the ball goes into a, into a place that you didn't mean it to go to the lie is horrible there's mud on the ball the wind's blowing the wrong way <laughs> um you know and the grain's in the wrong place or whatever it might be and not being able to adjust to any of those things so you you create this mental model based on an idealistic idealistic way that you're going to play the game and then all of a sudden when that changes you're not able to adapt to that moment and in a team sport environment it's the same so often teams go out with a game plan and then you often hear coaches using phrases like um you know, oh, we didn't have a game, we didn't have a plan B, or or we didn't, you know, we weren't able to adapt and we reverted to type and all these sorts of ideas. 
well that's because you've do, you've got this kind of pre-planned idea about what would happen as opposed to saying look there's going to be information in the environment it's going to be really useful to us to be able to solve the problem that's presented by our opponents today or the environmental conditions presented by our golf course today um, and actually they're the things that we need to be attuned to to help us with skillful performance and to, to be able to react to those environments. Now we're going to use any source of information that we can get from the environment as much as we possibly can. And some of that would be judging distance by eyesight, but other, 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 others of that might be about checking distance to confirm whether our eyesight is correct or not, or can confirm whether our feel is correct. And that's why you often see golfers, I think, sometimes confusing themselves when they get numbers because they go, oh, I don't know whether I'm in between club. They'd almost be better off to go with a feel than they would necessarily going with a number sometimes. But that's something that's been lost with yardage devices and people outsourcing their sensational feedback to to devices. But I'm taking us down an entirely different rabbit hole to bring us back in here. Um, I think, Will, you wanted to come in with another question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a sharp tangent. Um, what piece of research or personal experience has made you most question the, val uh, the validity of an ecological approach? To, to question the validity of information processing posts or ecological? <laughs> ecological. So which bit has made, which experience or piece of research has made you most question it as a valid approach? Um, for the, the longest time, and I, I've come around to, I have some ideas about this I'm writing about and stuff now, is all the anticipation research and, and, and work showing that athletes, if you show them a short view of stuff, they can predict whether a tennis shot's going down the line. Baseball players can pitch, predict what a pitch is going to be. So there's a long body and from one of my people I look up high, highest to and as a researcher, Bruce Abernathy. He's a fantastic researcher. He has this whole uh, series of studies on this topic. And to me, that was always, how do I fit that into an ecological? That sounds like information processing prediction, anticipating before you move. Um, but I think there's other ways we can kind of, kind of understand this. So that's for me. I don't know if the, anyone has any other one. That was, some, that was something when I first saw it, I thought, I didn't know where that was, where that where that came from. I have to admit as well, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, but I, um, I'm still a student, so I don't know if I'm if I've yet discovered something that has has made me have questions. I've definitely had some questions from the field, Will, more than areas of research, um, and most of those are just practical ones that I often just like how can you do that how could i do that how could i help somebody with that or how could and more often than not it's just my ability to be able to design the the learning experience effectively enough to help with that but that's usually because i'm pressured by time and it's the time constraint that usually i find the most difficult that's one of the, the issues is is that when the form of life if you like Re requires that you're in a very limited space in terms of time to be able to search alongside somebody what are the limits then of of the ecological approach in terms of its practical application in the moment um and so are there some interesting things that i'm still trying to work through that they're the things i would say that they're the questions i still have i suppose um, yeah. Simon, Simon has said, Rob, if you're all right with this, um, uh, Gerd, who's a field hockey coach, who's normally part of the conclave, but couldn't, couldn't physically join us tonight, has sent a question in via the medium of Simon. So it's gone okay. from the, the Midlands of the UK <laughs> over to Melbourne and then back. <laughs> Send it to Arizona now. So here we go. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am just an avatar. Exactly. Uh, no, um, <laughs> Good question. Um, it takes us back a, um, a little bit, to, um, and I believe um, Dave also uh, mentioned it um, in the in the comment chat. Um, the question was more about um, how does um, how does the value of, of of scouting of other teams, for instance, in team sports, then fit in with with local approach? So 
know, rather than like like getting, for instance, you were talking, we were talking about uh, golf and, and knowing the course and and uh, and having notes on that. What about what about scouting of other teams and how that to the college approach? I think I think I kind of would build on what Stu was talking about with golf. Here, it's kind of I would call that that's information like information that kind of forms a task constraint, like shapes your, you know, the, the my opponent all likes to go right. right. It's just kind of a task constraint that kind of generally gets you in the ballpark. Like yardage, so that's a three iron. <laughs> it's a start to the movement, the, the action that's like in soccer. You need to know the task constraint. I can't touch the ball with my hands. Right. There's definitely pieces of information we have that that form, but they just kind of get us in the right ballpark and then we get, you know, more specific control and things take over, I would say. But that that's a really so yeah, I guess I don't know it I don't know how much in terms of that example you give knowing details about your opponent um would help that's the kind of gets into the anticipation stuff I was mentioning, right? Or do you but do you better be just coupling to them and responding to them online, and you know maybe there's some some of both. I think I think that sort of information so than, as well. Oh, sorry, Sam. I, I think that sort of information is so, so rather than tuning to sorry, yeah. rather than tuning to um, rather than assisting the athletes or the participants to attune to more affordances, you feel um, that the better explanation is it actually. Um, it actually actually acts as more of a, a constraint a constraint on, uh, on 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 the options for the participants. Yeah, I I think we could think of it that way. Um, and the example given earlier about don't want to miss a shot to the right. You know, you can put a constraint on the on the solution um, based on that kind of information. I think you could think of it that way. A um, couple of other ones I saw here. I wanted to pull in. Uh, Mike asking about does ecological dynamics approach train mental skills? Um, my response here would be no, because what we typically mean when we talk about mental skills are general out of context abilities, like decision making, attention, vision, right? There's no, those have no value in the ecological approach, training those general skills. Everything is task specific, right? It's about coupling to your environment. So training general abilities in the mental skills, the, the way we think about it, at least from the action control, right? Maybe training, you know, confidence and things like that would be different, but from the action control level, that kind of work in, um, that's what I would say to that. I would probably suggest though, Rob, that working ecologically uh, one of the cell, there's a there's a range of different uh, self organizational responses that the athlete or group of athletes have, and I do think what are classically known as mental skills are one of the uh, forms of skill that emerge through working ecologically. So, for example. Are athlete, you know, so classically, we you know, do we train decision making? <laughs> Not necessarily. Um, however, what we do see is athletes attuning to information and acting upon the information, which you could call decision making. It's not necessarily decision making in the classical sense. It's not explicit, but it, you're seeing decisions being made, or at least actions that correspond with uh, information. As a as a means by which to uh, to make to make those to make those decisions in the moment, so that's an interesting thing in itself. And then there's a question about um, other. I, know, I noticed one that's come yeah, in from Greg Spencer, but also Marianne's got one as well about things like it, about imagery. So we're in we're in the same world now. Mm -hmm. And what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so I would agree with you, Stu. I think your point. It's all mental skills, right? Uh, you want you in tune to your environment. That's all, all built in there. Decision making, attention, educating, attention, perception. Just the don't like the idea of trying to pull them apart and train them separately. Okay, um, I think you know we could lose a lot of these tools. Um, observational learning, I think, is another one you can throw in here. You can put it. You can use it in an ecological way. Um, Self talk, you know, I have trouble with some of these because you're getting out of my realm. <laughs> I'm a motor action person. Self talk is about confidence and you know motivating. So, um, 
I think that's kind of a different purpose, right? Um, visualization. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know how that quite fits out to, I know people have talked about imagery in the ecological approach, um, but I haven't really looked at that in a long time. So I have to, I have to check that. I don't have a good answer. Well, I, I think um, a lot of Gabby Wolf's work probably fits in here as far as I'm concerned. I think, I think, I think classically these terms such as like visualization and self-talk and imagery are where I think people assume that if they can create a representative picture in their head that they can follow along with that picture. And I don't think the ecological approach would probably align to that. However, um, or, or if they can talk themselves into an action, I don't think the ecological approach would, would want to uh, argue in that way because it was that would definitely lend to, if I can get my brain to think in a certain way, then I can make myself move in a certain way. And the ecological approach would definitely reject that. However, if, for example, we were to use something we classically refer to as self-talk, but it wasn't self-talk, it was more of a, this is where I want to place my, my attention. This is where I want to place the focus. Um, and so a visualization is another way of placing attention. I'm going to place attention on, um, on, on being decisive. Yeah, so it's about clarifying intent. So visualization is a technique to clarify intent as far as I'm concerned. And if we're talking about the idea of acting on intent, we have to be clear on intent in order to be able to act. But it's not necessarily saying that we're, I'm going to think this, so do it. It's saying, let me clarify the action, clarify where where I want my shot to go or where I'd like to be with this or what I want to uh, how I want to act in this space. So visualization could be used in that way and imagery in that way. And this idea of self-talk is just could be a means by which to maintain your attention or your awareness in a space. And that in itself can be, I, I, I could imagine is one of the reasons I think a lot of athletes can sometimes struggle is because they, they lose the, uh, where they lose where their awareness needs to be. It goes elsewhere. So they lose their, um, like emotional control. Why? Because they've lost awareness of where they need to place attention. And I've worked with athletes before where I've talked about like this idea of staying in the red. And that's just this idea that we need to place our attention back on the important things, which is what's in the, what's in the, what's in the environment, what's going to help us solve the problem, because all the other stuff is going to take you away from that. And so I think there's something interesting in that. I don't know how much research is out there, but I, I just think there's, that's, that's my way of reconceptualizing some of these things yeah no I, th I think those are good ideas I, mean, I like the intention you also kind of you think about the feedback you're going to receive from your, yeah. your movement which is you know we sometimes forget about this that other half of this <coughs> coupling loop right it's co information coming back in i think that's a good question um are there any more we have a couple of some general ones about learning and developing practice i think we you know Check out some of the other videos on constraints that approach. I have a new one coming out, I think, later on on learning. If anyone's interested, um, I have a. Is any are there any more questions from the group? We'll wrap it up. Okay, thanks. I've got, I've okay, got a question, right. but I also okay, go for it. Marion and Luke also have a question, but I'll let them okay. go first. Who was? Uh, was that me? Because my question, my, well, my question yeah. was really was sort of really about about imagery that, that that we just discussed, and I think because it stands out for me because it's I think it's it's so ubiquitous when I read about athletes and their success and what they attribute their 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 kind of development to. So much of it is is imagery based, and I think when we talk about the problem with uh, with with represent representations in 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 skill development and in in the uh in the ecological approach the 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 obvious kind of example of that is is imagery as a representation and mm -hmm. so and where that fits seems important to me because i see it as so ubiquitous in when i you know when i read about the sort of a athletic success there's so much of it attributed to various types of imagery which is which is you know which is uh by definition a kind of a mental representation it's a, it is a really good point, Luke. And I don't, like I said, I don't think I can give a simple answer because you're right. It is a simulation of the mental simulation of the what's going on, which doesn't really fit with the, the approach. So I won't try to give a 
off the cup. But I think I can, like Stuart said, I can think of what it might achieve within the ecological approach. But I have less of an academic reputation to defend, so I'm perfectly happy to just shoot from the hip. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and I, I would just say, Luke, that I'm I have a theory on this, which is a, a lot of what people are. Tr I'm probably going to get slammed by the psychological community here, but what I believe to be is that what a lot of people attribute to be, you know, a use of imagery as a means by which for them to is actually them retrofitting an understanding of what happened to them in a performance space, and making sense of it through that description because it maps onto something they've heard of or been told by someone else. And Marianne's laughing now because she knows what I've just done. That's yeah, just a theory. I'm happy for it to be challenged, but that's a theory. I'd agree with you, Stuart, and certain. I think we have a lot of meta cognitive, cognitive things about the way we do things, actions, right? Uh, we try to understand, you know, athletes can give you lots of tons of descriptions about how they do things. So I think it's kind of the same thing. Um, I don't think it's how they actually control in the moment through these thoughts and things they think they're doing. But uh, so I'd agree with you to a certain extent. I think we can, if we are, we're asked to, we can, you know, um, that's my explanation for anticipation stuff too. <laughs> if you really force someone, um, they, they can, uh, they can do it. But I don't, I don't really don't believe it's what's going on in the moment. Can I, can I I'll just defend you, Stuart. <laughs> quick. Go, man. <laughs> <laughs> My question next, um, the the retro th fit bit, um, I I do agree with, but um, my my curiosity lies in some of those sports where the um, the a course is not seen, does is not known, but it is a set course. So, for example, things like show jumping, canoe slalom, ski slalom, climbing, lead, bouldering, speed. Um, I'm sure there's more. Some of the biking, mountain biking. Um, where you look at the course and then um, you need to go and um, complete it. And and most um, beginners struggle to just remember the course, whereas most elite athletes don't have any problems remembering the course at all. So um, I'm curious about what they pay attention to. And I, I remember early show jumping competitions, um, you know, never, never struggling to remember the course and having people come up and say things like, um, is number three the red jump? And I'd be like, I've got no idea. <laughs> because, and then I used to think it's because I'm colorblind. But then, I, then afterwards, I'm like, well, why would I ever bother to think about red? Because that doesn't give me any useful information. But I would know that the third jump would be three strides off the corner and it's a spread or whatever. So I would, I would have information that years later, <laughs> I retrofit it into an understanding of affordances. So I yeah so that that for me is um, I have a lot of curiosity about that because we do need to learn a course in a very short period of time and then and then have one or two attempts on it is is the competition so actually learning the course is part of the competition requirements it's one of the constraints of performance um, and the language that the athletes use will tend to be a mental rehearsal imagery because that's what they've been told they're doing <laughs> rather than maybe the, because of that's what they are. So I don't want to throw a No, I, th I think that's in. good. I often, I often hear that too. And I think, I think it, we, you, I think you would agree what learning the course means is very different for different people. Right. I think what people think they're doing is learning a series of actions, right? When I get here, I'm going to turn. When I get there, I'm going to jump. I'm going to get right. Um, versus I think, could also previewing a course could be right with stewards getting your attention in the right places for the right things right it helps it's information to guide guide attention so but um yeah i think there also you know this the you know memory we have these episodic memories of things you know they they happen right um we're not saying that memories don't exist it's just they're not used in the, the way that a lot of people think from controlling the actions that's what I would say. So if you for ask people about what they can, they can do it, right? They can do it. They can make a mental image based on a memory. They can tell you about the technique, right? Cause they have these things, but it's just in the ecological approach. We don't think that's what's in the moment you're using to control the actions. I, I remember you made, you made me think Marianne of, um, I remember a story being told to me some time ago or reading something about um, a Norwegian 
skiing team who you know they would obviously try and ski the hill and they'd have a sort of idea of the way which they were going to approach certain turns and all these sorts of things and what they found was they weren't able to actually articulate it using language so they created a new language which which was shorthand for sensations so it was about about the the athlete then beginning to uh look at the course or look at the um yeah the the, the slope and to, to 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 articulate it in the sense of the feel that they would have so that they're trying to evoke a sensation more than trying to just talk about a technical idea of the way that their body would move and actually it was actually just talking about a sensation and a feel and actually talking about the way the snow would feel for example or the way the ski would feel and and the pressures and these sorts of things and trying to articulate that that movement as and and the way they would go down the course in that way so it feels to me that that's similar to what you're talking about or at least that's what evoked in my mind yeah well, that's a great question um I was, so I think uh, oh sorry oh no. go ahead <laughs> I was gonna say I was always fascinated um in my um in my youth in Flamberis going into peat seats and watching the climbers you know sort of basically um doing that that same thing describing in these incredible language what they've done and and being able having a real awareness of stuff that they'd done years before as well in a way that the that a beginner wouldn't even remember the name of the rock and yet many of the elite climbers would um would would all, you know that you could feel them actually reliving an entire route quite easily which i just found fascinating yeah um sian bylock actually has some really nice work on like experts episodic memory <laughs> like you know every golfer mark you, you know you can remember every detail of every hole they can list tons of things but what they can't list as well is what exactly did you do when you made that shot the actual procedural steps involved right so um i need to wrap it up guys unfortunately this was a lot of fun but um i need to get back to uh real life here the kids are here in the background so um thank you very much for setting this up Stu and everyone this was a lot of fun robin um i i, I hope um uh, I'm speaking for everybody. I know I'll be speaking to everybody and saying thank you for um, being prepared to uh, do a Gibson purple what? Purple peril. <laughs> purple peril. <laughs> I, don't, I um, don't think it was quite that, but <laughs> I don't and, think I've done justice. But yeah. Well, we're all exploring, and so um, mm. it's great that you allowed us to explore with you and to you know the questions that you evoked with the materials that you presented. You know, I just thought were it would be useful to allow everybody to come and actually just, you know, hear you talk about them. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, to help to learn with us. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a exploration. So thank you very much. And thanks for everyone for, for listening and the great questions and great questions. Those are all really good questions from everyone. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks Rob.